Well, welcome to the show, everybody. Today, I have the pleasure to sit down here with uh, Bill Farmer, who you all know as the voice of Goofy and a lot of other voices as well, a native of Pratt, Kansas, and a proud Pratt High Greenback from the class of 1971. Bill, thank you so much for sitting down and join, joining me today. Oh, I'm glad I could join you. It's great to be back in Pratt, and uh, it's uh, a great honor that uh, I received yesterday uh, one of the original inductees into the Pratt High Hall of Fame. I never thought that would happen in a wildest dreams, but I'm uh, deeply honored and I've had a lot of travels out to Hollywood over the last uh, 50 years since I was a senior here at PHS and, uh, you know, a lot of travels and it's really nice to come home. Well, good. And that, yeah, this year was the first year they were doing that Greenback uh, induction ceremony for yeah. a Hall of Fame and you along with Don Bueller and uh, Dorotha Giannangelo were right. the first class to go into that. So right. out of all the awards that you've won, where, where does this stand to be recognized by the hometown and in something well, like this? I've once, uh, uh, you know, uh, in Hollywood, an uh, Emmy's big. I've been nominated for an Emmy. I w am a Disney legend. I got that award in 2009 along with, like, Betty White and Robin Williams. And so that's the biggest honor that Disney have. And that definitely is a, a biggie. Um, also an Annie Award, which is kind of like the animation Oscars I got for uh, working on, uh, you know, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Uh, or not, not, That was actually for uh, Mickey Mouse Shorts. I did a cartoon called Goofy's Grandma, where I played Goofy and Goofy's Grandma, and I was awarded with that. And that's a big honor. But for the heart, it's this one. Absolutely, because this is my roots, this is where I'm from, this is where I grew up and had all my friends, and it's just really feels good to be honored by those that you grew up and loved. Well, we we're honor honored to have you and as a, as a greenback, too. So give us a little bit of, and I'm sure you've given it a million times over, but just the, the story of Bill Farmer, you know, growing up here in Pratt, Kansas, attending KU, moving out to Hollywood. Well, we, I have my... Uh, uh, best friend and, and uh, next door neighbor, Ted Emerson with us today. And he can probably tell you a lot, a lot of those great stories that we've had to gr together growing up, but it was a typical kind of a uh, uh, growing up story here in Pratt. I was born here in Pratt, uh, went to Haskins elementary school, uh, which was right across the street from where I lived on Manor road, which is just exact, you know, it's one minute to the school. It was very convenient. Um, Growing up there, I was one of those kids that I loved movies and I loved television and, uh, you know, just kind of thought about Hollywood. And I remember the exact time when I thought, you know, maybe Hollywood and movies and stuff would be a great living was in a movie, a Ray Harryhausen movie at the Baron Theater called The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. And it had monsters and dragons and cyclops and fighting skeletons and all of this stuff. And I just thought that was just a cool world to be in. And I knew there were people that did this for a living. And I thought, wow, that'd be amazing. But Hollywood's a million miles away. And uh, you tell that to your parents and they say, oh, no, be a, law do a lawyer, a doctor, a, you know, something like that. So I kind of put it out of my mind, but as I got older and just watching cartoons and things, I just started doing kind of some impressions of the thing. I think the first one I ever did was Don Adams of Get Smart. If you remember the television show Get Smart in the 60s, and I, you know, people would say, hey, that's, that's pretty cool, you know. And then, then, then I did Jimmy Store, and, and then it uh, progressed to you know, high school when we would do pep assemblies and we would be fighting, you know, Dodge City or something. And they'd have me come out as John Wayne. And uh, then I'd, you know, do a little pep rally thing like, well, let's get those Dodge City demons and get out there and whip them, you know, and stuff like that. And that was, you know, it was fun. And uh, it's kind of, you go, hey, that's kind of cool. Well, nothing really happened to it until I went to KU and because I did some voices at my fraternity and we'd have band breaks at parties, they'd say, farmer, get up and do something. So I'd have to write some material. So I had something to say and do some little voices and it progressed. And I decided to go into broadcast journalism. So my degree there is from in journalism and long story short, I uh, started in radio somewhat after that in Texas, a little town in Bonham, Texas, uh, th much smaller than Pratt, much smaller. I think our station wattage was 500 watts, which is a couple of good light bulbs. And uh, moved there to Frederick, Oklahoma, and then 1977 moved back here to Pratt to help my mom out at home and lived at home for a while. 
and uh, worked at KWLS or KWNS. When I first started, it switched over to KWLS while I was there and stayed here for about a year and figured, well, you really can't go home. You got to make your life some way. You, you just can't come home. It's not the same. And so I moved back down to Dallas because um, I'd been there before and liked it, worked as an electronic technician, and then in 1982, got out of radio altogether at that time, and uh, figured I can make more money doing anything than this. But uh, then in uh, March of 82, went up at a place called the Comedy Corner, a uh, comedy club in Dallas, an open mic night where anyone could do five minutes, and I got some pretty good response. The house comic who's gone on to fame named Bill Ingvall was the first one to say, you know, you ought to, you ought to do this for a living. You really ought to do it. So I started going back week after week. And within a better part of a year, I was traveling around Texas to Houston, clubs there and Austin and all around the state doing stand-up. And you work your way up. And about five years later, in 1986, I was just starting to headline clubs. And with my wife, Jennifer, we decided, well, let's give the big leap to Hollywood. Let's see what happens out there. An agent said I should go out there. So I got an apartment in Hollywood. Jennifer stayed in Dallas. And for about a year, I kind of commuted. But during that time, I got the audition uh, for this uh, kind of uh, wacky, goofy character from the Disney company and off and running. I've been doing that for 34 years and about 4,000 programs for Disney and others over the years. And um, it's been a great ride. And now I get to come back to Pratt. So it's kind of that circle of life that they talk about in The Lion King. Yeah. Getting that, you know, you mentioned that audition uh, for Goofy. Was that something that you sought out or was that something that somebody reached out to you and said, we think you'd be good for this? The way it is, is at the time there were four or five Mickeys, four or five Goofies, Donalds, you know, a guy down at Walt Disney World, a guy doing record albums, and they're all somewhat different. It's not exact. Roy Disney, Michael <laughs> Eisner uh, decided to have one person do each of the main characters. So they put out a big audition, everybody in Hollywood. <clears throat> and about... Um, 1,100 people, as I understand, tried out for Goofy, and they liked mine because he was always my favorite character growing up. And gorge, <laughs> I didn't do it in my comedy act or anything. It was just something I played with a little bit, kind of like Mickey Mouse and gosh, you old boy, you know. So I just practiced these voices. And, you know, you just put it out there. Uh, I got a cassette of the original voice, had to match it over a weekend, put it in. About a month later, they said they'd like to use you. And it's not like they sign you to a big contract. I've never been an employee of Disney. Every job I do is a new contract. So I'm kind of like the plumber. I'm an independent contractor, and I can work for Warner Brothers or Sony or any of the other studios. And every time I go out, it's a new contract. That's interesting. Now, Ted, uh, growing up with Bill, sorry, I didn't uh, get you on the introduction there, Ted, so apologies for that. Did you know at some point, you know, we're like, this this guy's pretty good. Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, he says he wants to do voices in Hollywood, and if my buddy would have said that in high school, I'd have said, okay, great, <laughs> that's great. But did, did you know or, at, or see that in him? Actually, think, I think he could actually do it. Yeah, at some point that actually did happen because uh, and Bill and I, uh, uh, I'm very – honored to even be his best friend and i certainly consider him my best friend but uh but yeah he started a like the rich little thing is what i yeah. kind of remembered and on saturday nights or it was a saturday night that rich little there we couldn't do anything else we had to watch the the rich sure. little show and all his <clears throat> impersonations and that's and bill would actually do those right you know in his living room right after rich little yeah. And uh, so I, 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 I heard them a long time, and definitely when he started doing our uh, pep assemblies at the high school, I mean, that was obviously a hit because every, it was a skit. It wasn't just Bill yeah. up there doing voices. We had the villain. We had the Dodge City oh, Demon. Yeah. We had the – and they, there were two or three other actors in, involved in that. Oh, that yeah, thing. we had uh, – we had uh, Super Frog and Toady. We invented Frog. our own Batman and Robin. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, one great story that we were talking about yesterday, we did one. I don't know if you remember when we had a, a, my go-kart. I had a little go-kart I made. 
and we put Steve, who uh, Steve Ryder, who was Super Frog, out there, and we wanted the fire to come out the back like the Batmobile. So I made some gunpowder, and I put it in an old shotgun shell, and we taped it to the back of this thing. Well, we lit it, and we pushed it out on the gym floor, and it starts sputtering and throwing pieces of molten gunpowder and burning the floor. And I think those burn marks are still there after all. I got in trouble for that. <laughs> what are you doing burning up the gym floor? You know? <laughs> we had a lot of fun. I don't think you'd get away with that today. <laughs> oh, no, but there were different times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So did you guys stay in touch then through the years as, you oh, know, yeah. high school and college went on? And then as you yeah, moved to Dallas in, and on, to we Hollywood? Actually, and, uh, we actually uh, went from kindergarten all the way through college together. Yeah. And uh, so the... In the senior year, Bill was in a in a fraternity house, and mm -hmm. the senior year at KU, he moved in with me just so we would kind of have our last, yeah. you know, our last hurrah. Uh, but we've we've continued to be friends and do things and go on golf trips, and yeah. uh, so that that has been a what I, maybe we probably met when we were three. I would imagine, probably yeah, probably when uh, I think you moved next door to me when yeah. you were about three years old, right. and from then on, uh, you know. And it was uh, the other the other thing I always remember. And, and by the way, we are both very proud to be from Pratt. Oh and, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, we we like it. Uh, we we always love this hometown, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but back in those days, uh, people didn't lock their doors. So yeah. our houses were, if I wanted to see Bill, I went in the back door. Yeah. There, there wasn't any knocking or anything. You just go in. And mm -hmm. if I was hungry, I would, yeah, I would come get over something out of the refrigerator. Same thing over there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, it, it, Pratt's a wonderful place to grow up. It really is. And we both went to Haskins School. I think we, we were... To, so buddy buddy that they separated us i think around second no, or third no, grade kindergarten kindergarten we, we were together that's the only time we were together because they had like two first grades two second grades we were always in opposite ones they keep those guys apart that's too uh they're around each other too yeah, much we got in a little trouble out on the playground in kindergarten and of course we did everything together and but it was a col collaboration. Yeah. Uh, it was the school officials and my mother and his mother said they are never to be in the same class yes. again. So we were always in the opposite classes. Abs it may have been a good thing. I don't know, but... <laughs> I'm a little nervous to have you here together today. <laughs> well, we didn't get separated very often, no. but uh, we were the only other, the only exception to that was uh, band. Yeah. Because we only yeah. had one band instructor. So, so. Yeah. And we both and I, played saxophone. Yeah, but wasn't I first chair and you second chair? That's probably <laughs> it. I was not that good. Yeah. Which is funny because, uh, as my wife uh, says, she has a, a jazz piano degree. My son's a professional drummer, and I got the gold record. So... <laughs> But Not, luckily, you don't expect Goofy to sing well. So. Yeah. You know, you guys talking about elementary schools a little bit ago, and you were speaking at some of the schools yesterday. I remember, yeah. I, I can't remember the year, but it was when I was in elementary school at Haskins. You were back for maybe a weekend or an event right. and came and spoke to us. And, uh -huh. and then you actually, you came out to the house that day after school, to, I think, say hello to dad. And I thought that was the coolest thing that oh, Goofy's at our house uh, telling all my friends about it. But Going around to speaking at schools, what do you speak to the kids about? And is your is your speech to Pratt kids different than other other schools that you might go to? It's generally not different because kids all over have the same thing. When you're going a, a teenager, you're full of angst. You got, you know, you you get a pimple and you don't go to school because you're so oh horrified or whatever. It's uh, mostly about letting go. One of the things I've learned over the years is that you cannot allow shyness and insecurities to affect the way you, you know, work in life. As an actor, I'm in a booth with a glass between me and the director and the, the writers and whoever. And when you first do that, it's very intimidating. You don't know, you know, they're kind of motioning, they're talking, and you think in your mind, oh, this guy really stinks. Let's get someone else in here. And they're really just saying, no, I want cheese on that burger and stuff. So it's, you just play games with yourself in your mind. So I always say I have to put Bill over on a shelf and let whatever character I'm doing, like Goofy, 
take over my concentration 100%. Because if you let that concentration lag, the acting's not going to be as good. So to be authentic, and the acting is the most important part in voice acting anyway. It's not just doing voices, it's acting. I learned that long ago, and that uh, you can't do as good a job if you're not concentrating. And I always use the analogy because uh, Ted and I golf a lot. It's like golf. Uh, you can explain, you know, uh, voice acting as easy as you can golf. Hit the little ball a few hundred yards down there, knock it in that hole. You can explain it in five seconds. Doing it takes a lifetime. Same thing with uh, voice acting. It, uh, it's a technique, and it's uh, not, not just doing funny voices, but it's acting. And uh, that was a long, hard, uh, and so I teach that kind of stuff. I say that uh, you can, in, you know, you can ensure failure, um, um, but you can never ensure success unless you try. So it's to get out and try. Don't let your inhibitions and stuff hold you back. That's another roadblock that just keeps you from doing stuff. So those kind of life lessons. And then I show behind the scenes of animation and some videos of how it's done, you know, and answer questions, what the kids want to know. And I've been doing that for many years, and I teach students who want to get into voice acting now. Uh, I do lessons. I travel around. I was in Akron, Oklahoma, about uh, Akron, Ohio, about uh, two or three weeks ago in Lexington, Kentucky, doing some seminars and greeting the public and all of that kind of stuff. So that keeps me pretty busy. And uh, the, the lessons I was teaching yesterday were pretty much the same here. You know, you, you mentioned getting over that you know, getting out of your head and, yeah. and things like that and just having that self-confidence. Right. Was there a point in your career, you know, after you'd gotten goofy or doing some of that stand-up where you kind of had that moment where you thought, yeah. I'm, I'm big time, I made it. You know, I, you know, you hear it from athletes a lot where they say, man, it wasn't until we played against my third year in the league that I realized I belong here. You know, was there a, a defining moment in your career where you thought? It was a gradual um I, uh, I, well, first when I got the job, I didn't know how big it was because after one job, they may never call me again. Like you're not signed to a long-term contract. And then I got another job and another job. And over the years, it was gradual. And I thought, yeah, this, this may last a really long time, but you're really only good as your last job. So it could quit at any time. And I'm always cognizant of that. But, uh, and I think after the Disney Legend Award in 2009, I think, yeah, I finally got the job because now they gave me a trophy. <laughs> <laughs> and a parking spot. Yes, yes. <laughs> and a parking spot. And a free pass to Disneyland. That's that right. was a big one, I think. <laughs> how, how difficult is it to keep a voice the same over 34, 35? How long has it been since you've been yeah, goofy? Is it 34, uh, 35, 30, 35 years? 35 years. 35 years. So, you know, as your voice changes... Goofy's no, voice I look changes. different, but I sound the, the same. The, the voice Luckily, is the, the same. voice doesn't change that much until you get much older. Frank Sinatra sang from the 40s to the 80s. And uh, so it does tend to stay, it doesn't age as much as uh, the body does, luckily. And it's also just like staying in shape. If I don't do a voice or goofy or something for a couple of weeks, yeah, I feel a little rusty. It's like jogging or something. If you get in shape and you lay off a couple of weeks and you run again, you say, what happened? I'm kind of losing it here. So you always got to keep the, the muscles in shape. It's a muscle, you know, thing. That's interesting. I, I don't have a lot more questions for you, Bill. Um, you gave us a good rundown on on uh, everything and where you're from. Paula's sitting over here on the on the outside with a bit of a list. Paula, do you got anything that we can add to this? Other awards that you talked about last night. Yes. Yeah. Go over those again? Oh, uh, the other awards I've gotten over the years, well, uh, several uh, from several Disney organizations and fan clubs, I've gotten uh, little legend awards kind of like that. But the Disney Legend Awards is the biggest one. That's the one that, uh, that uh, I got in 2009. Our... Um, they have done that since 1986, the first one. They've always been posthumous, too. Uh, Fred McMurray was the first one in 1986. There's about 200 so uh, total now. And uh, Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse got were the first ones. He was ailing uh, health-wise the year before me in 2008, were the first, as I understand it, uh, living people that got the Disney Legend Award. And I was in the second year. And ours was the first in front of the public. So we were in front of 4,500 fans at the D23 convention in Anaheim, a Disney convention. 
And Bob Iger presented me the award. He's the head of the Disney company. Uh, Tom Bergeron was the announcer, and I got my award with about 10 people, some posthumously from the Golden Girls, and uh, then they had Betty White, who was still around, and uh, and got hers along with Robin Williams. And uh, me and Tony and Selmo, the voice of Donald Duck, got our awards that day. And that was a heady experience because just being in front of 4,500 people and on the stage with Robin Williams, and uh, that, was, that was amazing. That was definitely a defining moment. Also, the Annie Award, the Annie Awards for short for animation awards are uh, an organization through the screen uh, it's through uh, the um, um, academy of television arts and sciences their awards for animation and i won that in i think it was 2004 do you know jennifer 2014 uh was my annie award yes. in 2014 for playing a, a goofy and goofy's grandma in a cartoon called goofy's grandma and that was for best acting in a television series, an animated series. And, uh, oh, also the Frizz Freeling Lifetime Achievement Award was from the International Family Film Festival, which uh, I was, uh, I think, the first actor, or definitely voice actor, to win that award. And that was a big one as well. And now, the Pratt uh, Hall of Fame. Well, all, all great awards yes. and a long list of them, and I sure appreciate you sitting down with me. Ted, thanks for joining in also. Fun to hear the two of you talk about some stories from, from back in the day. We're pretty proud of him. Oh. <laughs> well, we're glad we could have him. Uh, that's going to do it for me, unless you guys got anything to add to it. Ted, Just, you good? It's, it's great being back here, and uh, I was telling my wife today, coming. it's almost like one of those Twilight Zone episodes where you come back and everything is so familiar, but... I don't remember that building. Something's different a little bit. So time changes things, but a lot of it stays the same. And that's the best part because it brings back a flood of memories of growing up here and going to the, the swimming pool and running home and hailstorms because they closed the pool because a tornado was coming by or anything like that. Uh, just so many uh, great experiences growing up here. It was a, a delightful experience. And, you know, you take that through life with you those experiences that you have when you're a kid. And uh, that's so important and uh, wouldn't trade it for the world. Well, that's neat. And it, this was an experience for me sitting down and chatting with you. So again, I appreciate it. And that's going to do it for today. Thanks, guys. My pleasure. Thank you.